Hey, I can accept that. I was a little worried. I'm, I'm fine with Ant-Man. That's cool. One of my favorites. Uh, I did see uh, the movie late Thursday night before flying here, so I won't spoil anything. But since I've got the mic now, I will say I was thinking for myself, I had to choose. It'd probably be Hawkeye, by which I mean no real special powers, but I'm a decent shot, I think. Family man, really called to another life but happy to come back here and play on the team with gods and heroes. So that's, because when I think of myself, I mean, I've done all this Greek stuff in past years, but really um, I am interested in sort of other issues uh, as much. And so anyways, but I'll take Aunt Manna's wine. That's great. Um, let me start with this uh, beautiful piece of linguistic vandalism. Actually, in, th in this, this sense, this has become a professional version of it, but... This started as people adding that bottom line to the normal line that you'll see everywhere, including, uh, so I just saw a sign of it here, maybe on our bathroom door here. But this one has become a professional version. Again, if employees must wash hands. If no employees are available, you may have to do it yourself. Now, I love this for many reasons, um, but it's especially appropriate for here, uh, for this discussion today, because this plays on the happy ambiguity uh, in the sense of wash hands, of course, which in English uh, is technically, typically, or is uh, ambiguous in its non-inflected syntax, which is typical of English. And it really plays on transitivity issues, doesn't it? I mean, this is the question. Um, is the, the washing understood uh, transitively? Well, no, we sort of naturally understand it's not to be taken transitively. Um, it's instead to be taken in a somewhat reflexive sense, but it's ambiguous in the form that we usually use it without those bottom two lines there. Um, and I use this as an intro because it really provides a, a good seg into the question of the middle voice. And I only saw last night with a mild panic that I was supposed to speak on voice where I thought I was speaking on the middle voice. So I'm not going to talk about all the active and passive, but I think what matters most for us probably here is the middle voice because of its difference. But it, it, this is a good transition to that because, first of all, it's a reminder that different languages map reality differently. Um, and I'm revealing my cognitive linguistic sensibilities there. But they, different languages function differently in how they think about, in this case, voice. And also, I think this is a, a good transition to our discussion of the Greek middle because one of the early, and turns out, not particularly helpful ways to understand the Greek middle voice from an English perspective was to think of it as a reflexive. And you'll find that in some of the earlier uh, discussions of the Greek middle, that it's really kind of like an English reflexive, which is problematic, I think. Of course, a lot has been going on uh, in our discussion of um, Koine and Hellenistic Greek in the last 25 years, as you're well aware, um, and we've already heard, actually, even just in the last hour from Khan, the Greek verb, of course, has been a big part of the focus of our increasing understanding. And of course, a lot of that has, to, has had to do with tense forms and aspect. But another secondary, and secondary in both the amount of time that it's been given and the heat that it has generated, Secondary to that is another issue of the verb, and that is our reevaluation and understanding in the Greek verbal system as it pertains to voice. And particularly, the trickiest and most unfamiliar part of the Greek voice system from an English perspective, what we call the middle voice. And so for our time today, I'm going to talk a little bit about what has happened in recent years and then try to give a little suggestion for understanding the middle voice and then together think about... Uh, you know, practical a little bit what this might mean in some text. So a couple of qualifiers. Well, the first, again, as I said, I'm not really going to be talking about the active and passive voices, more the middle. And secondly, um, I my pronunciation of the Greek is going to be Erasmian, so my apologies to those if that, like, grates on your soul or something. So I, I just too, probably not too old to change, but I'm, I'm open to change, but it's still what I've done for years. So, but let's talk about what has happened in recent years on the issue of Greek voice. So in Con Campbell's book, Advances in the Study of Greek, he has a chapter on deponency in the middle that I think gives a very helpful uh, brief history of what has happened on this topic in the last 15 years or so. <clears throat> and since I'm one of the people that comes up in there, 
and I was there kind of at the beginning of when these things started to change, I thought it might be helpful to kind of go back, and I did myself, and go back and look at and try to remember what had happened, what I was thinking, what some other people were thinking. I'm able to, guess, only really think about what I was thinking about it. And, and to just kind, of, kind of describe the history of what's happened to this in the last 15 years, especially some of you may not know this. So back in 1998 and 99, so uh, gosh, 20 years ago now, I was working on these New Testament Greek vocabulary cassettes. Yes, that is what I said, cassettes. So this was even before CDs, which are so passe now. But I was uh, a student. I was living a couple hours from Trinity. I was an evangelical free church pastor. And I was driving two hours each way back in the day before cell phones even, really, and had made these cassettes back in the late, mid-90s uh, to learn vocabulary because there really wasn't anything like that. And then I had, um, long story short, I'd begun uh, to sell a lot of them because I am an entrepreneur at heart as well. And what that resulted in was I was putting together, as often done for learning vocabulary, lists of words by frequency, leaning on some older works, Metzger and others, and as I was compiling this list, it began to dawn on me that there was, there was some confusion and really some inconsistency in when it came to what we'll call lexical headword forms, like what is the form that the lexicon has for the verb, um, for a number of verbs that I had learned on back in my Wenham um, uh, grammar that I had learned on, that I had learned as deponent. And of course, a deponent verb in the modern period has been traditionally defined as a verb that occurs in the middle passive form, but is actually, wink, wink, active in meaning, borrowing from this Latin term deponere to lay aside, because again, the assumption was, and the way it was taught in the grammars I always learned from, that these were again actually active in meaning, but somehow they, poor souls, they had lost their way and they had laid aside their active forms now. And so that category is introduced in grammars and has been in the modern period um, to make sense of words like erkamai, of course, or decamai, which appear anomalous to the standard, of course, formally, they don't have the omega pattern that we've become used to, but they are, from an English perspective, and that's key, functioning like active verbs, therefore they must have had some deficiency in them, their deponents or something. So those inconsistent, the inconsistencies were that when I was looking up words by frequency and trying to figure out the best glosses for them into current English, um, it really stood out to me that there were several words that the lexicons were either inconsistent with or really just the opposite of what the data read. For example, fabeo versus fabeamai. What is the lexical form of that? What, what should we say that word is? Should it be given in the omega stem or should it be, giving, be given as a medio passive or the amai form? Uh, some of the indicative, some of the lexicons listed it one way, some the other. Uh, sebo, seba, mai would be another. And so it just began to raise the question for me about how grammarians decided which words were supposedly deponent or not. Is that just a function of extant morphological form? So do you just look at the corpus that we're dealing with? Do you just look at Koine? Do you look at broader Hellenistic? Do you look at Septuagintal included? And how do you decide then, so if it's always in a, a medio passive form, is it therefore um, a deponent or a middle only verb? Just how do you decide that? And as I began to dig deeper into this, so I was an MDiv student at this point, and as I began to dig deeper into the, the subject of the grammar of deponency, I found a bunch of comments from a lot of the older grammars that expressed a lot, well, current grammars too, that expressed a lot of uncertainty regarding our understanding. Stan Porter had written already in his Idioms of the Greek New Testament, he says, there is, uh, this is from 99, I think it was, there's room for much more work in areas related to Greek voice. One of these is deponent verbs. So he had seen something there. Dan Wallace said, the criteria for determining deponency still await a definitive treatment. And then going back to earlier grammars, I was surprised to find an even stronger sentiment, very disparaging remarks about the category of deponency from someone like uh, Moulton. He calls the idea of Greek deponency unsatisfactory, which in British terms probably means I hate it and I want to nuke it, probably unsatisfactory, um, but they would never say that. Even more stoutly, A.T. Robertson of my own school um, always puts deponency in scare quotes and writes, the truth is that the term should not be used at all. 
So here I am, an MDiv student, I'm you know, doing all this lexical work and then finding, wait a minute, we all teach deponency, but nobody really believes in it. Like what's happened here? Um, and so it only served to pique my interest more. How could it be that something so standard in the way we were teaching uh, was so profoundly questioned by all these leading grammarians uh, current and past? So back in 2001 or 2002, I did an independent study uh, with Bob Yarborough, who was a mentor of mine at Trinity and a good man. And that became my first published article in 2003 when I was still, I was then in St. Andrews doing a PhD. And my first, very scary, I still remember how nervous I was uh, in 2003, my first paper in the Biblical Greek Language and Linguistics section at SBL, which for the last 25 plus years has really been the, the clearinghouse or the kind of ground zero. Those are, I don't know if those are good metaphors, but a, a place where a lot of this discussion that we're having this weekend uh, really got its start, uh, thanks to Dr. Porter and many others. And so I gave a paper there, and through my connections with Zondervan, I had been doing some work with them, I struck up a friendship with the delightful Bernard Taylor. If you don't know who that is, he's an older uh, Seventh-day Adventist scholar who's trained in classical Greek, and he had been doing a lot of Greek lexicographical work, and had actually come to the same conclusions that I had about the problems with the lexical headword forms and opponency, kind of working independently. So we got together and started to share notes. And so in that first article in that 2003 SBA, SBL paper, my thesis was this, that deponency is a grammatical category that has been misapplied to Greek because of the influence of Latin grammar and because of our unfamiliarity in English with the Greek middle voice. Most, if not all, verbs that are traditionally considered deponent are truly middle in meaning. Therefore, the use of the category of deponency again, verbs that are middle passive in form but active in meaning, needs to be at least minimized and possibly rejected altogether. The middle is not reflexive very often. We, Greek has a reflexive uh, pronoun and adjective, as, as we've often come to disabuse second students of. So, again, deponency uh, is taught as verbs, again, that are middle or middle passive form but active in meaning, and that's mistaken. I discovered, as I continued to study, that originally Greek had no separate passive voice, that that actually developed later from the middle and then eventually took over such the middle has gone away. And so then I reflected in this original paper what was the meaning of the middle and began to read some people in linguistic studies. Susan Kemmer was an early person and some others who began to think about, long before me, what was going on in the Greek middle. And it's a broad group and it's hard to find, but what most people have come to describe it now is subject affected, with an A, subject affected. That is action on or for or towards itself, which is where the English reflexive idea gets conflated in there because there's, it overlaps with reflexivity, but it's not the same thing. It's some action on or for or towards itself or the subject affected in it. And again, deponent is this Latin term of lay it aside, laid aside that is put onto the Greek system because from an English and possibly from a Latin perspective that's debated, it was different. So the two wrong turns that I identified that had led us to this deponency mess was that again, we were thinking in, of Greek through the lens of two other languages. First, English, and at this point, I didn't know much about linguistics at all, I'm certainly no expert now, and certainly didn't have any insights from what came to be called cognitive linguistics, but I, so I wasn't able to fully articulate what I've since come to understand, that again, we just basically ne need to let Greek map its own language in its own way, very different than English. And of course, the most obvious difference is we don't have three voices. We have two voices in our system. And so when we've looked at Greek and taught it in English, we have this sort of weird category. We've got the two things that seem natural to us, active and passive, fine. And then we have this other thing we haven't known what to do with. So we've kind of said, well, here's this other middle thing, right? And that's how I had been taught Greek and it's how I was teaching Greek, I think. Um, and so English is part of the problem, our understanding. And then of course, as I've already mentioned, the, I think an undue influence of Latin, which of course, as you all know, and Khan just mentioned in his paper as well, during the Renaissance and later, Greek was really taught naturally through Latin categories because that's what everyone knew already. So I suggested, better than deponent, that we understand Greek medio-passive forms as, again, subject-affected or subject-focused in many different ways, and that includes 
reciprocity, self-involvement, intellectual activities, emotional states, volitional activities, things that are done with self-interest, um, sensory reception, states and conditions, all of those would be ways in which a verb could be presented in a kind of subject-affected way. I recognized already um, early on here that there were some potential problems with what I was suggesting. Um, a couple of them that come up as early objections would be the idea of future middles. So if you think about your principal parts chart, if you believe in those, um, some do, some don't. But if you think about some verbs that we know as omega stem, so they're active in their normal function when they're in the present tense form, but then when they go to the future tense form, they appear only in middle forms, right? So those are called future deponents a lot of times, or future middles. For example, anabino becomes anabasamai. Um, estheo, we say the future of that is phagamai. Lambano, lampsamai. Uh, pino, piamai. So that's one potential, uh, you know, what would seem like something like, oh, this is deponency, right? You've ca you've, they've somehow lost what was their active form. I don't think it's really a problem for a couple of reasons. One is many times these are suppletive verb situations. They are situations where another verb stem has become associated with a, a different one. So of course we, I always describe it to my students in the English example of go, you know, what's the past tense of go? We don't say goad, even though children do, you know, it's a natural productive form. We say went, so it, but there was a verb wend, W-E-N-D in English, and at some point in the mystery of history, go lost goad and went lost wend, and it was, they got married. Second marriage, maybe that's not the best, best uh, metaphor, but <clears throat> whatever it is, they, they became, one became suppletive of the other. And so we certainly have these things happening in Greek. Estheo, phagamai, you know, it's a suppletive verb situation. But even in the cases where the stem is the same uh, and it's gone from a present to a middle in the future, um, as Susan Kemmer and many others have pointed out, the future, which is this mysterious thing within the whole verbal system, of course, um, reflects a mental state. And so it could be that many of these verbs are middle because they're part of this world of a mental state, uh, which is appropriate for the self -effect subject effectiveness of the middle. So that's one potential problem that I don't think really is a problem. The other is what we call passive deponents, which if you look in your older grammars or most grammars today, you'll still see that. And these are situations where you have a middle verb uh, in the present, but then when you go present tense form, then when you go to the aorist forms where there is a distinction, of course, between the middle and the passive that there's not in the present tense form, you switch to a passive. So an example, of course, uh, apocrinomai, right, which we would describe, I would describe as a middle only, but older grammars describe as deponent. Um, a middle-only verb, ap apocrinomai, most often it's spelled how and spoken how in the passive, in, in the aorist. It's spoken with the passive. It's got that strong theta, eta ending on it as well. So apocrithe, for example, or often in the participial form, apocrithes or something. And so these were perceived by people as another example of some kind of deponency where um, a middle form has lost it. It's kind of a confusing example because it's still using a medial passive form, but it's going from a passive, in the passive it's going to, sorry, in the heiress is going to a passive form. Um, again, I don't think this is a problem um, because what's actually happening, I think very clearly, and I'll come back to this here in a minute, is what we might call a slippage of register that the MP1 forms are being encroached upon by the MP2 forms. The theta eta's are taking over um, from the, um, the middles in the aorist, largely because of ease, I would suggest to you, right? That is that it's much easier to produce these theta eta forms than to remember the sigma alpha tense formative plus the middle endings, especially when you have a liquid ending stem, right? So something like apocrine, right? You have to remember, and imagine if you're a non-native speaker, or you're, it's not your mother tongue, and you're speaking Greek, then you'd have to remember to add that, what's going to happen when that sigma, you know, adds to that new, with that sigma, those uh, aorist middle endings, forget it. It's just way easier to say apocrite, 
right? And if everybody starts saying apocrite, then you just do that and you don't worry anything about it. Nobody's thinking, oh, this is a passive deponent or something. No, it's just, the, it's just the way the usage happens. It's much easier to remember and reproduce these theta, eta forms um, than the sigma, alpha, middle forms. So <clears throat> I don't think either of those are really a problem. So then finally in this original paper and article, I talked about what I call the lexicographical dilemma, that is how to determine these lexical headword forms. Again, it should it be fabeo or fabeamai, and I suggest that we use all of Hellenistic Greek to determine this, and we should give the headword head word forms in the medio passive um, if that's its primary usage, and I give some examples. So how, how am I gonna know on my time? What's the, oh, that, and what time am I going to? Oh my, okay. So at this paper, Stan Porter very kindly, and especially if you can imagine, and, some, and many of you have experienced this, your first SBL paper. You know, I was very, I was very nervous. Stan was very kind afterwards and took a keen interest, encouraged me, as did some others, that what I was doing was worth pursuing, so I was very thankful for that. And that led to a fuller, more mature, and slightly differently focused aud uh, article in an edited volume some of you may have seen, uh, The Linguist as Pedagogue, I don't remember what year that was, where I discussed some of these things more and began to actually read and cross linguistics more and recognize that actually there's a lot of languages that have a middle voice that functions the same way, Sanskrit, Icelandic, Mojave, all these others. And that resulted in uh, some other uh, articles and things I discussed. As a result of that, um, steam began to build and other people who had, you know, know a lot more about these things than I do began to develop and think about these things. And we discovered that there were other people outside of the New Testament world, classicists like Carl Conrad, many of you know that name, and linguists like Rutger Allen, um, who knew a lot about these things and had something to say about it. So the result was, over the next few years, two different sessions at the Biblical Greek Language and Linguistics section dedicated to this topic. In 2010, we had the BGLL session on the middle voice with uh, Stan, Bernard Taylor, Khan, and myself. And my paper, Test Driving the Theory, Middle Voice Forms in Matthew, reflects a little bit further understanding. I don't know where I am. This is a completely unhelpful PowerPoint, sorry. Um, but it reflects some further understanding on my part. Oh, was there a handout? There was a handout. Okay, you got that. Okay, good. Just panic moment there. Sorry. Good thing we're recording this. This is very professional. Um, but anyways, trust driving the theory. So I basically took the middle voice uh, work I've been doing and just tried to look at Matthew, which is my main area of study, and came up with some, by the help of others, some terminological clarification. Again, this, what I described as MP1 versus MP2, that's not original to me. The MP1 forms are the my Sai tai pattern, the MP2 are the theta eta. And I basically just went to the Gospel of Matthew and tried to say, okay, what happens if we adopt a more middle voice sensitive approach, recognizing the MP1 and MP2 forms? And noted several middle only verbs that often are misunderstood as active ver uh, forms, at least within Matthew. So euangelizomai, sebamai, fabeamai, those are middle only verbs that use the MP1 form. And then something about apocrinomai and some others. Um, and, base and then also looked at some interesting words like hopto and hoptomai, arco, archomai, and suggested that actually in several of these cases, <clears throat> take arco, archomai as a good example, we often describe that as um, two different, or one word that in the active means one thing and in the middle means another. I'd like to suggest to you instead, at least in that case, that it's, that that, and I could be wrong, and I'd love to hear especially some of those who know more about this than I do, but it seems to me it's instead, it's just uh, their homonyms at the phoneme level, and they really, uh, the, even at the lexeme level, I guess, their, their, their homonyms, they sound the same, the arc, but then in the active, it's one word that is completely different than in the medio passive, which is another word, and that's why rule and uh, begin are different. Maybe there is an etymological connection at some point, but I think that they're actually two separate words, and it's an example of our confusion of the modal voices kind of brought these things together. Um, so that was the 2010 session. There were other good papers there where I think all of us were sort of uh, 
going full board on recognizing we need to get rid of deponency. And that resulted then a few years later in 2013, um, the next session we had on this was called We've Killed Deponency, Where Next? Which I always personally thought was a little violent um, to <laughs> describe a session. I don't know whose uh, idea that was. But again, it included myself and Bernard Taylor, who I mentioned before. And then we brought in this classicist linguist, Rutger Allen, who's written a whole book on the middle voice, who was, you know, really knows his stuff. Um, and my, in my paper, I was helped by a former student of mine at that point, Bobby Jameson, who's gone on to do a PhD at Cambridge and is a brilliant guy. Um, and the three main points I made, um, just some updates to my own understanding, and made some suggestions, uh, so reiteration of the morphological approach I was suggesting, MP1 and 2, and then some practical suggestions for Greek. For me, what I had come to understand a little bit more, through the help of many others, is that there was a, there's a subtlety to this idea of subject effectedness. With the middle, the subject undergoes an effect of the event, and again, that can include mental processes, translational motion, spontaneous process, and again, the best person on this is Rutger Allen on the middle voice in Greek. But what I had not understand, which I understood with more subtlety now, is that the middle voice doesn't just, doesn't only encode subject effectedness, but it's marked for it. So. The middle and active are a binary opposite pair. The active voice is the default and is unmarked for subject effectiveness, but the middle is marked for subject effectiveness. Thus, the active voices don't exclude the idea of subject effectiveness. They're just unmarked with regard to subject effectiveness. They're neutral, but the middle does mark for subject effectiveness, and I think the reason that subtle distinction is really important is because it helps understand why, especially from an English perspective, why uh, some verbs that are active still you could perceive them as as you can't understand why those are not middles. That is, they seem to be subject affected. I think if you understand that, and I think this is Alan's argument if I remember correctly as well, if you understand that the this, the active voice is just not marked either way, you could still have some subject affected notions, and they may just be from an English perspective too, but you could have them where if you know, if you're in the middle, then you know that there is some subject effectiveness being marked. I thought that was helpful. And also I learned more about the issue of transitivity going back to that initial um, slide as well about the washing hands, that there's a deep interconnection between voice issues, obviously, and transitivity uh, going on that are complicated, right? So what I suggested to you is, or what I suggested in this paper, is that to teach the middle voice, because that's what it really comes down for many of us here, um, I suggested, along with and getting some help from my colleague Peter Gentry and Steve Rungi and others, and Carl Conrad, the idea of using MP1 and MP2, the my tai versus the theta eta pattern, right in elementary Greek, and I do this, explaining that difference. Um, and I call these verbs, I never use the word deponent except for just to you know recognize, I tell them this is still out there in a lot of language, you should know what it means. But I prefer to call these words just middle only if they are in uh, the MP1 or MP2 forms. Um, and then with the help of uh, Bobby Jameson, my student and friend, came up with this kind of rule for translation to teach even just elementary Greek students. When you see a medio-passive form, begin with the assumption of subject-affected markedness and ask whether the subject is the agent of the action uh, or not, and then you translate it appropriately into English. If the subject is the agent, then that's going to translate in English, of course, into an active form. And so if you start, though, start beginning teaching elementary students already at the very beginning that um, you assume subject effectiveness and then ask the transitivity question, that will, I think, make sense of it. And I think students can get the hang of that. Um, I, I think they mostly can. So, um, and that kind of relates to this, this uh, just understanding the middle voice uh, a little bit. And I've kind of gotten at it. And again, let me just recommend to you a lot of people that know a lot more about this than I do. Steve Rungi, Liz Robar, Peter Gentry, uh, Michael, Mike, and Rachel Aubrey have done excellent things in the Greek verb revisited. They have fuller discussion of this beyond what I'm able to give you here. But I, I think I give you on the handout a little help. This comes from my colleague, Peter Gentry, whose name you probably know as well. And just thinking about intransitivity and transitivity and ditransitivity, and the sentences have different roles. You can see that information. And basically just recognizing that Greek is a binary system. 
that has both a default, again, and a subject focused or subject affected. So if you can reconceptualize Greek as not from an English perspective of active versus passive, but it unmarked versus a subject focus, I think that'll help you uh, begin to reframe it in your own mind. So final point then, reading biblical Greek wisely. So similar to the discussion of aspect that's been happening for the last 25 years or so, um, I would say when it comes to voice, be wise and don't overstate things on either side. Um, be wary of any simplistic arguments based myopically and narrowly on a view of language as a magic formula. Of course, it's not going to solve all our problems that once you've discovered the middle voice, all of a sudden it fixes all these things. Um, but what are some potential insights from recovering the middle? Well, here's some ideas. Potentially, one thing that we can learn by rediscovering the middle, getting away from deponency, is recognizing there may be nuances, there probably are nuances in groups of words in a semantic domain that include both actives and middles. So to go back to the old Laonida, if you look at LN 39.1 to 39.61, as well, that's hostility and strife, you know, from this sort of approach they do, or military activities, that's section 55.1 through 55.25, where they list all these words. Um, in those two categories, there are 53 Greek words that are listed for fighting and struggling, so hostility, military activities. 29 of those words are active, and 24 of them are middle-only verbs. The active verbs seem to communicate the ideas such as waging war, persecuting, attacking, triumphing, conquering, overpowering, instigating rebellion, where the middle-only verbs in that category seem to be much more personal and psychological, personally opposing someone, contending for something, rising up in pride, struggling against or for a person or thing, joining in a verbal attack. Um, as in all these things, be careful. I'm not saying that it can, it's, it's this magical, magic silver bullet that all of a sudden you can say, oh, it's, you know, it means this. Context is always king here. But just to recognize that the reason some of those verbs in these semantic domains are active and some are middle only probably has to do with this idea of their perception consciously, probably not always, but um, as most language speakers are not conscious of what's going on in their own language, but still the way Greek maps reality, the subject affected idea uh, distinguishes some verbal notions from others in a way that we just don't have in English, right? So you just have to sort of embrace that and appreciate it. I think it's an interesting nuance. Um, looking at more specific examples, I think the example of aiteo versus aiteomai, is a very interesting one. Um, I ask, right, if we can generally gloss it that way. This word is very common, of course. It occurs in both active uh, and middle forms in classical Greek, the Septuagint, New Testament. The active forms, if you kind of look at it chronologically or diachronically, seem to be on the rise, which is normal. Uh, if you take the Septuagint, uh, there are 93 instances of aiteo, aiteomai, 55 of them are in the middle, 37 in the active, one passive. In the New Testament, you have 70 examples of aiteo, aiteomai, 32 of them are in the middle and 38 in the active. So it's really, these are, this is a verb that's really split. Old uh, BDF observes that there was a classical Greek distinction where the active aiteo was used for request in general, while the middle form, they say, was used for asking for a loan or asking in a situation of commerce because it's more personally involved, right? BDF suggests the same is going on in the New Testament. Interestingly, BDAG disagrees. So there's, you know, these sort of giants of the 19th and early 20th century German scholarship. There's a disagreement on whether this distinction holds in the New Testament. So I studied this myself and feel very inconclusive on the results as well. It's very mixed. Um, who am I to debate between BDF and BDAG, right? But, um, but there are several passages in the New Testament, interestingly, where both the active and the middle forms occur together. So in other words, it'd be one thing if you could just kind of say, well, um, you know, some authors prefer one and some authors prefer the other. There are actually several passages, say, for example, Matthew 20, uh, chapter 20, verses 20 to 22. If you have a Greek New Testament, we can look at them real quickly here. We got a few minutes. Uh, Mark 6 and others, where they're actually the same verb there is used in both active and middle. One of the most interesting ones, and in most cases, I can't see any dis difference, but one of the most interesting ones, if you have a Greek New Testament, you can look at James 4, 2, and 3, 
which um, is this discussion, of course, of you desire and don't have, so you murder, you covet, because you don't obtain. And the solution, or the description of this is, uk echata diata me I taste thy humas, so you do not have, uh, because you do not ask, James 4, 2, and 3 is where I am. So there's your uh, medio passive form, a taste thy, and then immediately it says, you ask and do not receive because you ask um, according to your own, to spend it on your own passion. So if you look at the pattern here, you have a middle form at the end of verse two, an active form at the beginning of verse three, and the middle form in the middle of verse three. So wow, that's pretty remarkable, isn't it? Um, so even if you don't have a Greek New Testament in front of you, you can just get that data. You've got a middle form of Ita'o, an active form, and then a middle form again, right in the exact same uh, sentence. The commentators, many of them don't reference this at all, but some of them have debated it. An older James commentary, Mayer, or Meyer, says that the middle is subjective or dynamic. Um, so prayer of the heart versus outward action of prayer or asking. I don't find a lot of people that have followed him on that. I haven't looked back at more some more recent commentaries. Others have observed that maybe, and this is the complicating factor with the with the epistles always, that maybe James 4, 3a where is a direct allusion to the uh, active from Matthew 7. And of course, the, there are deep interconnections between the Sermon on the Mount and the book of James, there's no doubt. So could it be that the middles are what James was using, but then when he quotes or deeply alludes to Matthew 7, which uses the active, he uses the active form. So that just complicates it. Like, so you don't know for sure, did he intend to distinguish between these or is the one just the form of the quote that he would have known and therefore in his mind it was should have been a middle verb but then he quotes the Jewish tradition as an active it's hard to say um, and that may be enough of an explanation because it's hard to say for sure in that case what distinction there would be going on just between those three instances of it right so maybe it's a quotation situation it's hard to say um, but the point at least is that when you have the category of middle only, you don't just write it off as deponent or insignificant, you recognize they're subject affected, at least you can ask that question, right? At least you can say, is there any significance to this? In this case, it seems difficult to say. Another one that may have something to it, if you think about Mark 6, and I'm sorry, this isn't on the handout, Mark 6, 22 to 25, where Herod, um, you know, gives promises up to half his kingdom to... Uh, Herodias's daughter when she dances. If you look at that text, it's interesting you that Herod uses active forms, you know, ask whatever you'd like and whatever you ask, I will give. Those are both active. And then when she runs to mom and then comes back and, uh, and says, or says what to ask, both of Herodias's daughters are middle forms. So right in the very same passage, you've got the same lexeme again, going from active to passive. Could it reflect the classical Greek distinction between a general asking versus a more contractual or subject affected asking? I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to die on that hill, but it's at least interesting to consider that he, ought, he makes this sort of general offer, ask whatever you want. She comes back with what may be a lot more pointed language, like you got to promise me this, like there's a subject affected element of this as well. I don't know, just, just an idea to consider. That's an interesting example as well, and we could look at others. So let me conclude with this. Um, simply, there is more work to be done um, on the whole issue of the Greek voice system in the middle. I think one obvious thing that needs to be addressed is our tagged texts that are the basis, of course, for our um, all of our digital resources. Um, I'm less inspired by the digital resources, maybe, uh, than my brother here, uh, only in the sense that I realized that though, I mean, I'm very thankful for them, I really am, but they're only as good as the tagging of the text, right? And a lot of times that text tagging well, I, I think in every case it's been done by humans, so there's one issue, right? Uh, but then it's often been done by students, frankly, which is okay, but most seasoned scholars are not going to do a lot of digital tagging. And so it reflects some, you know, potential weaknesses. And then there are issues like this that 
we're only now coming to understand that the middle voice, I don't know why I keep looking at you like you're, like you're a false or something. I don't mean that. Um, I just mean that I, when you look at the tag text, so even to try to get at this data, you're dependent on some, how somebody tagged a text, right? And so you, you know what I mean by that, right? So whatever put in the database of what the taggings are. So when you go to search it, so if, and it is the case that people didn't understand these distinctions, these subtleties between middle and if they're written off as deponent, then you're really limited on what you can even access to the data except for doing it manually. So I think it's time, and I know it's a huge undertaking, but to reconsider the tagging of our databases, whoever's controlling those, I don't even know, um, more sensitive to the issue of middle voice, right? Um, and then more studies on particular words, I think, are, are worth looking at them. So, to conclude, I'm very aware that my small contribution to this discussion, I really am standing on the shoulders of giants like Thor and others. Um, and it is an exciting time to humbly be growing in our understanding, especially seeking to understand Greek on its own terms. And in this instance, as part of a family of languages that maps the verbal matter of voice very differently than English does. There are lots of languages that have this active middle uh, binary pattern. Um, and therefore to, again, not overread some biblical texts and also to possibly catch some nuances, don't underread them. And so whether we are in the modern West or in ancient Greece, I'd encourage you to wash your hands of an English only understanding of the voice before returning to the work of reading the Greek Bible. So thank you. <laughs>